All right, I'm done talking about chaos for a while. Two videos in a row all about chaos, and the third one was all about Games Workshop getting on their knees and bending over for chaos. We're done here. Instead, it's time to talk about something I like, something near and dear to my heart, a fantasy race I hold above all others. It's time to talk about elves. Ah, but which elves? Age of Sigmar has so many kinds of elf. Elves with big snake mommy. Elves with cows that think they're dwarfs. Elves that are homeless because those armies can go to hell, I guess. So many wonderful choices and so little time. But for now, I think we'll settle on... These elves. The Ideneth Deepkin. I've not been too into the Ideneth until recently, but the more I look at them, the more I like them. I mean, the ocean is goddamn scary. You ever see what's down there? Nothing natural, that's what. Now imagine if the ocean could come to you and the people that apparently live down there want nothing but to eat your your soul because that's the only option they have. So how about it? Do you own an aquarium? Are you interested in the benefits of being a marine biologist? Do you like Big Turtle? Then keep on watching because the Iden of the Deepkin are the elves for you. The Iden of the Deepkin, being a creation of Age of Sigmar, not a holdout from fantasy, were a result of Teclas trying to recreate the old fantasy High Elves, but not really knowing what he was doing while he did so. After Chaos blew up the old fantasy world, Slanesh naturally saw all these unattended elf souls and went to town eating them. Problem was, there were a lot of damn elves in the fantasy setting, so she ended up with some indigestion. So she crawled away and hid in a corner. I don't know how you do that in the warp, but she managed. Then Tyrion, Teclas, and Malekith, fuck your copyright GW, found her and started beating the elf out of her. Literally, they extracted Elven's souls from her and split them among themselves. Teclas got the first batch, primarily consisting of the followers of the old elven god of the sea, Mathlan. With these souls, he set about recreating the high elves of old. Problem was, all of the elves he created had magical PTSD from being Vord and had these patches of blackness on their very souls that he just couldn't quite figure out. Whenever he tried to figure out what's up with that, it ended in failure, and also usually a very painful death for the poor bastard he was examining. So, seeing how everyone who went to see Dr. Teclas never came back, eventually the rest of them pissed off to the bottom of the ocean after stealing the lamp Teclas used to find elf souls. Why the ocean, you might ask? Well, as it turns out, when you want to hide, there's very few places better than the bottom of the sea. It's quite dark in the Marianas Trench, and the pressure curses everything that doesn't have the magic to survive down there. It also dulls the senses of everyone. This is really important because if you know Warhammer, you know that the elves have some trouble with a certain god of pleasure and excess. It's hard to experience either when the only sensation you ever have is being faintly moist. When they ran off, Teclas did try to kill them because he was afraid that they were all corrupted and would turn into chaos spawn or something, but Tyrion told him to chill out, and Teclas figured he owed him one after the whole sacrificing your daughter to Nagash thing, so he let the Ideneth be. Of course, they weren't done getting shafted by the universe quite yet, this is still Warhammer we're talking about. Turns out, Teclas was probably onto something, because they get not only one, but two curses to deal with. The first is called Malachi, or however you say this, which is, and I'm quoting directly from the AOS wiki here, a state of raging madness that ended in savage debauchery. So imagine the Blood Angel's black rage, only it ends with sexual assault, instead of thinking everyone around you is named Horus. That problem was rare, thankfully, though I don't think there's really a cure for it beyond hoping that it doesn't happen to you. The other curse is that 99 out of 100 new Ideneth kids have souls that wither away within days of being born. That one's, uh, that one's a little more common. Thankfully, this one had an actual solution. Eat the souls of some helpless landlubbers. I guess they found a few Dark Elder codices lying around for inspiration or something. They also tried to pray to Mathlan after they ran away from Teclas, but he was a bit too busy being dead, so now they try to recreate him. Haven't fully done it yet, but one of their units literally has the guy's name in it, so they've had some partial success at least. For thousands of years, they would raid the surface world in secret. By secret, I mean their raids had a casualty ratio of 100%, so it was less thieves in the night, and more like when you get fed up trying to stealth it in payday and just start massacring everyone in a general direction. Then they tried to invade the Sylvaneth before Ilariel kicked their asses, but she was kind enough not to tell anyone else about them. For, you know, some reason. Probably a good one. I assume it was just because they were the first mortal beings that weren't made of chlorophyll she talked to lately, so she was just happy to have the company. They also found the Stormcast too at some point, who were happy to make friends with people who were firmly in the We Hate Chaos camp. Overall, things were finally looking up for the Ideneth. Then the Skaven did what they do best, royally screw up in a way that hurts everyone else more than it hurts them. While they were busy doing what they do second best, dicking over Nagash, they accidentally drained an entire ocean away into a void of nothing. If you were wondering, yes, of course Thanquil was involved. For the Skaven, it actually did end up drowning half of Skaven Blight, which is nothing because they probably repopulated in about five minutes. The real problem here was that Nagash now knew who was stealing the souls he thought belonged to him by decree of he really wants them. So he started draining oceans so he could kill the Ideneth and stop their quote-unquote theft. By this point, if people didn't know about the Ideneth, they did know that the god of the dead was showing up outside their house to turn the local lake into a salt flat. Now with their cover more or less blown, they gotta figure out how to survive in the new age of Sigmar. 
title drop. That about brings us up to speed for everything you need to know for the Ainanath Deepkin's backstory. So why pick the depressed, waterlogged elves? Well, if you've ever looked at the Dark Eldar and went, I wish they were less horrendously awful, then here you go. On the surface, you may think they're pretty similar due to their shared habit of stealing souls. That and the fact they're both elves is pretty much where the similarities end. If you give the Ainanath unrestricted access to a town full of resources, translation, people, they'll take everyone in the town and leave. They won't take anyone else, they'll just take the town and head off back to the deep blue sea. They only do the soul stealing thing because they physically have to. Not because they kind of have to, but also because it's really fun and living a life of discipline to avoid eternal damnation is boring. The Dark Eldar, meanwhile, would abduct the town, move on to the next 50, and complain that they had a pretty uneventful raid this time around. The Idanath also don't mutilate and torture their victims for the most part. Sure, it's unpleasant, and you can't really ignore the fact that they steal souls, but again, they actually have to do this, and they at least try to do it with a minimal amount of pain for those involved. They also look into ways to try to end the soul problem permanently. The Dark Eldar, meanwhile, torture you until you should have died, and then prolong your life to torture you more. Fun! When faced with other options, such as the Path System or any ad to avoid Slanesh, the Dark Eldar, meanwhile, would say no to those because they can't murder eight people for their weekend plans anymore. The Adonith are much more tragic overall than the Dark Eldar, so if you want your army to be something closer to raiders, but still want them to be somewhat sympathetic, then the Adonith are good to go with. Despite all this, and despite them being elves, there's no fear of playing as a dying out race with the Adonith. Nagash is coming for them, and without soul stealing, their lives end almost as soon as they begin, but in the lore they've had such success with secrecy and their raiding that they've been able to expand pretty frequently. It's to the point that individual sub-factions of the Adonith have themselves had sub-factions break away off of them. That kind of thing doesn't happen if there's only like 10 guys per city. Despite this, they also still manage to pull off the endangered elf trope because of how they're portrayed. They're so obsessed with secrecy and the consequences of them being found are so severe that playing as them, every battle feels important. I think they hit the sweet spot. Lore-wise, you won't feel like playing a dying race, but you also won't feel like you're just playing an army of invincible Mary Sues. Or Skaven, I guess. Now here's a bit of a curveball for you. Do you want to play an army that feels like it's from a horror movie about the ocean? Because that's what fighting the Idanith feels like. Think about it. Imagine you're some fisherman in an isolated little hamlet down by the ocean. You go out to catch your fish, you come home and speak to the dwarf who owns the tavern while you slam a few drinks back with your buddies. Life is good. Then coral, shipwrecks, and other sea life start sprouting up around you. The sea itself seems to twist and turn in ways you've never seen before. And the simple act of moving is suddenly stiff and awkward, like you're doing one of those horrible pool runs when you try and go anywhere. Suddenly, eyeless and deathly pale elves come bursting out of the waves, riding a Mori eel's big brother and stab your grandpa in the throat before turning your home into a ghost town. Did I not mention that most Idanath don't have eyes? Because most of them don't have eyes. There's a reason people fear the vast emptiness of the ocean, and in Age of Sigmar, that vast eldritch place can come to you at a moment's notice. To put it academically, the Idanath Deepkin are fucking horrifying. I imagine trying to invade them or sail through their waters is even worse. Take Sunless Sea with all of its eldritch gods, sea beasts, and crewmate cannibalism, only had more Falmer. You've essentially got what it's like trying to invade the Idanath Deepkin with that recipe. At least if you aren't someone like Nagash who can god magic his way to winning, or the Skaven doing it by accident. Even if you don't want horror movie at sea vibes, their models still look gorgeous and bring a never before seen look to Warhammer. In fact, fictional settings in general can use more things like the Idanath. The Eidolon of Mithlan has this kick ass water cave flowing behind him. The Soul Render, with a first name that looks like the guy who came up with it, had a stroke of playing Scrabble, has this awesome pirate hook halberd. The Big Turtle. Aside from just being gorgeous models, these models really look the part of a seaborne faction. It really makes you feel like you're bat part of the ocean. Seriously though, Big Turtle, 10 out of 10 Games Workshop, cannot wait for the big octopus. Not joking, I love this thing and I want more like it. You've also got a lot more freedom with which to paint your models than you might think at first. Sure, you can paint them all in ocean blues and greens and whatnot, which will look stunning, but the ocean can be a very colorful place. Go ahead and paint them in the colors of the rainbow and march forth under the banner of the Great Barrier Reef. Or paint them in dark, muted colors to go for that horror movie vibe where creatures from the darkest depths rise up to devour the surface dwellers. And of course, if you like pirates, here's the faction for you. Because raiding on the high seas can only get better when you can bring the high seas with you wherever you go. The pros just keep coming because now it's time for what they do best on the tabletop. I lied earlier, they do indeed have a few other similarities to the Dark Eldar. For one, the item of the Deepkin hit like a Mike Tyson uppercut. For the most part, once you get into the melee with the Deepkin, if the enemy doesn't have a pretty high save, then they're done for. And because not only are all of your units incredibly fast, but several of them also have the ability to fly, or float, I guess, you're getting into melee range. They've also got a wide variety of cavalry options to close the gap with. This is unfortunately dangerously close to Bretonian territory, but they're riding sharks and eels instead of molesting horses, so they get a pass from me. Either way, say goodbye, enemy backline. The Idanath are coming at the speed of sound, and they're not stopping until you're turned into a chum bucket menu item. They've also got a pretty decent range game, too. Now, personally, I don't think it's fantastic or anything, so don't go expecting to unleash the wrath of soggy Napoleon on anyone or anything like that. But their basic archers are decent enough, even if you do need to get rather close to make the most out of them. And the wish me luck of pronouncing 
pronouncing this one, Achelian Alapex can hit pretty damn hard itself, too. It's not like the Beastmen were grabbing a few Ungar archers can end up just feeling like a waste. Their magic is also solid. It's not fantastic, but in my humble opinion, it's good enough to be put in the pro section. You've naturally got your wound spamming spell, but interestingly, the Idanets version targets models, not units. So feel free to pick whatever the equivalent to a sergeant is for a given unit and watch it get crushed by the pressure of the deeps. And no, I'm not being melodramatic. That's what the spell is called. Pressure of the deeps. It's Warhammer. Subtlety can go to hell. You can worsen a unit's run and charge rolls. You can worsen a unit's rend. And unless I'm reading it wrong, as a spell, you can just give a unit deep strike to plunk it right down behind the enemy. Once more, eat shit, backline. They've also got their rituals, which I'm lumping in with magic because I don't really know where else to put it, to be honest with you. Pick an Isharan unit for your army, pick one of the rituals, and they just last the whole game. One hurts people when you retreat if they're too close. One gives certain units a 5 plus ward save. One gives certain units a plus one to run and charge rolls. And the last one makes certain units unable to be shot at farther than a foot away. Nothing that's gonna mind break anyone, but certainly some helpful stuff to be had. Lastly, Big Turtle. It buffs surrounding units. It has powerful ranged attacks. And if you've ever stuck your hand near a snapping turtle's mouth, you should know what to expect from a version of one scaled up about a hundred times. With one exception I'll get into shortly, there's no reason to dislike Big Turtle. Now for the flaws of the elves whose soul drains out of their very bodies. In fact, that's a good place to start. By design, your faction will have a crippling weakness, and nearly everything they do is gonna revolve around it. I think it might be the most serious one in all of Warhammer, 40k included. Yeah, the Eldar get their souls devoured on death if they aren't careful, but they don't have to do anything in life to avoid getting extra cursed beyond don't get killed. The Idaneth, meanwhile, constantly have to raid to survive and expand. A human soul, for example, doesn't give an Idaneth its maximum lifespan. They need several to get that. It is something that entirely envelops their society, with the lucky few born with souls lording it over the rest, and all things they do are taken with the soul-fading curse in mind. If you don't want something like that constantly hanging over your army, then you don't want the Idaneth from a lore standpoint. You also won't be making many friends as the Idaneth. They're an order faction, so you can have alliances and allied detachments from order, but from a lore standpoint, no one likes you. You're tolerated at best. This is because, again, the soul thirst means you need to take souls wherever you can get them. And if you're running low on souls and the only reliable source happens to be a village of Sigmarites nearby, then well, so be it. Nagash may hate them specifically, while Chaos and Destruction obviously are going to be gunning for you regardless, but even amongst Order, the only people more distrusted than you are probably the Daughters of Cain. Which I guess this can be a positive if you're the kind of person that makes edgy deviant art OCs, but for everyone else, yeah, good luck making friends with the neighbors. Even beyond that, most people see their obsession with secrecy as generic elven aloofness taken up to a hundred, which of course, they are aloof like all elves, but not to the extent the others of the mortal realm see them as. They aren't ignoring you just because you're a human, they're ignoring you because they're afraid saying hello will beam information about their hidden enclave to everyone in a hundred mile radius. That's a hundred and sixty one kilometer radius for my non-American viewers. Another flaw, which is incidentally another similarity to the Drukari, the Idaneth definitely favors smaller scale engagements in lore, or at least avoiding open battles on an apocalyptic scale, that is. There's a lot more similarities to the Deldar than I thought when I started writing, but I've already recorded the line, so I guess I'll just look like a clown now. Now, they won't avoid a good fight to the extent of the Dark Eldar. I mean, they're not just avoiding fighting because they're doomed to eternal torture the moment they die, like the Drukari are. But if you think about it, their modus operandi is still that of being raiders. Their ideal engagement is to go into a lightly, if at all, defended town, and while they won't avoid massive engagements like the Dark Eldar if they can help it, they're still not going to be the guys in a massive, realm-shaking level engagement. Sure, that means more souls, but it also means more dead elves, and they would like to avoid that if possible. Finally, fish puns. If you don't like fish puns, then this is obvious. But even if you do like fish puns, you'll have a shell of a time when the other player punches you in the face for saying things like shell of a time every combat phase. Some people just don't have thick fins, I guess. I personally think it's rather shellfish to dislike someone over some harmless fin, but some people can't help jumping the shark, to be sure. Now, if you're done trying to strangle me through the screen for that barrage of garbage, time for tabletop. I'm once again comparing them to the Dark Eldar after saying there's not actually that many similarities between the two because there's nothing I like more than the taste of my foot in my mouth. In the same way the Dark Eldar hit hard but can't take a hit, the same goes for most Idaneth units. Now, of course, Big Turtle will take on all challengers that aren't Gotrick, Archeon, or some other big-name guy like that, but your average Idaneth foot soldier is not going to be sticking around for too long. Some of their units are more durable than you'd think, such as the Ishlayan Guard, but the key words there are more durable than you'd think. You won't be beating other factions' most defensive units, you'll either be matching them or survive long enough to dish out the damage regardless. There are exceptions, sure, like the Skaven, but those exceptions usually have something to make up for it. Like, yeah, of course one Idaneth is better at fighting than one rat, but there's never one rat. As for their magic, the spells are fine, but the spell casting itself isn't great unless you bring one of those Mathlon guys. The problem there is that he's a rather expensive model, both money and in-game point-wise. That, in fact, is the same issue with Big Turtle, which is indeed the only issue with Big Turtle. I believe he clocks in at around 500 points less I checked, which means in smaller games, he's just not going to be showing up. And in bigger games, taking him means you might be crippling yourself by not bringing enough foot soldiers or anything like that. Relatedly, the 
Skydenith have a bit of a problem building a varied competitive army. Now let me just be clear, it's far better than it used to be. Previously, an Idenith army would consist of eels, eels, more eels, and maybe a shark thrown in if the game was a larger point one. But even now, because things like the Eidolones and the Turtle are so pricey, you're still incentivized to take a lot of eels and smaller units than some of the more spectacular units. This is due to boring things like point cost efficiency and crap like that. It's the same reason in professional level Total War tournaments you'll see 20 different mid-level units and no one ever takes like a Hyro Titan or Bloodthirster. Having fun, unfortunately, often comes second place to winning. The Adonath also have less unique models than a lot of different factions in Age of Sigmar. True, they're not anything like the Fire Slayers, where even the quote-unquote different models are all pretty much the same thing, visually speaking. But they're two different units of eels, both come from the same kit, as do the two Eidolons. Even with everything else said and done, including terrain, there's only 18 different models. What they do have is truly unique and stunning and stands out from each other, it's just they only have so much to work with, unfortunately. Price is also, unfortunately, another issue with the Eidoneth. They're big units like Turtle and the Eidolons are expensive to buy, and while I can give GW some credit for making their faction leader character both under $60 and reasonably strong, to fully utilize a competitive Eidoneth army, you'll need to shell out a lot of money for a lot of eels, and that will add up rather quickly. My advice would be to start small and buy a few eels, infantry, and a character or two for some smaller scale games, and see if you like their playstyle. Otherwise, you will end up rapidly sinking a massive amount of money for fish. They are most certainly not the custodies of Age of Sigmar in terms of pricing. Or anything, really. I don't know why I made that comparison. And there's the basics of the Eidoneth. There is, as always, more to get into, but we're here for the basics, not for a three-hour-long analysis video. I'm far too unfocused and unintelligent for that. Why do you think I hyper-fixated on Big Turtle the entire time? As always, thank you to my wonderful channel members. You are the ocean to my Eidoneth, allowing me to swim freely in the great waters of YouTube for the times to come. If you'd like to support the channel, feel free to become a member or subscribe to inflate my burgeoning ego. Either way, thank you for watching and take care out there. The real question when deciding upon the Eidoneth is, of course, if you can handle that sweet and salty Eidonussi.